Welcome everyone. I'm Rita Fleming Castaldi, and it is my privilege and pleasure to be presenting tonight's webinar, which is hosted by Therapy. Let me just mute everybody. Okay. Everyone is muted. You will be able to unmute yourself. All right, I'll start all over. I am Rita Fleming Castaldi, and it's my privilege to present tonight the webinar about frequently asked questions about the 2024 MBCOT exam and effective MBCOT exam preparation for OT exam candidates. I am Therapy Ed's Director of OT Education, Editor of Therapy Ed's Certification Review and Study Guides, and Therapy Ed Course Instructor, who has had the privilege to meet some of you during our free weekly online office hours. I do recognize the couple names there. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been an occupational therapist for over 44 years, and my practice specialty is mental health practice and community participation, and disability rights for all, including people who have serious um, physical disabilities and need to use personal attendant care, and also historical literacy. In addition to my therapy at roles, I am Professor Emeritus at the University of Scranton and the chairperson of the Occupation Therapy Leaders and Legacy Society History Preservation Project. In 1993, so 30 years ago, I became a program director, and that was when I became involved with helping students prepare for the MBCOT exam. Basically, the students said in 93, came from direct said, we're really overwhelmed and we don't want to feel overwhelmed. Can you and the faculty put together a course to help us prepare? So we did. We put together a content review course and we included some questions. It was mostly about helping students organize their studying. This was before therapy had, had, had the book. So there was nothing really that could pull everything together. So from 93 to 98, we did, we did that course and actually we did it up to 2002. Um, but in 98, Therapy had contacted me and asked me to work on the first edition of the Review and Study Guide. And the first edition was published in 2000. So 23 years later, I have just completed the 10th edition along with my co-authors and contributors. And the 2024 10th edition has been completely updated to reflect the 2024 Occupational Therapist exam that MBCOT will initiate as of January 2nd. Tonight I am joined by Paula Carey, and Paula is a therapy course instructor. She also is the author and editor of our, of our course slides, and she is a therapy tutor. And Paula, if you would like to briefly introduce yourself, and thank you so much. There, it helps if I unmute myself. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be in the background, being the moderator, letting people into the room. Um, I'm taking notes about where people are um, heard about the this webinar. And um, I've been with Therapy Ed for over 20 years now, and overall been an OT educator for 34 years. And I'm so passionate and invested in helping people pass their certification exam at the COTA level, at the OTR level, and it's really a privilege to work with the group of people that I do at Therapy Ed. As Rita said, we have wonderful colleagues. So thank you very much for joining us this evening, everyone. We're up to 197, almost 200. <laughs> and for two weeks before Christmas, that's, um, that is, I, I really appreciate people taking their time. And, and it's Hanukkah, it's the night of Hanukkah. So I really, so whatever holiday you celebrate, this is a busy time of year. So I appreciate people joining us this evening. Okay. So I'm going to go through a few logistics. Um, I did mute everyone, so there's not distractions in the background. But please do unmute, you know, turn on your mic when invited to share any question or concern. If you do have any questions during the formal presentation, please jot them down. The presentation is intentionally designed to answer frequently asked questions that were asked about the exam. So it's likely you're going to receive the answer at some point. However, we are going to have a formal Q&A session at the end. And... But now, because Paul is moderating, during the session, if there is something that is unclear, please put your concern in the chat box. Oh, and Paula, I knew you were coming. My subliminal message, I did not take your name off of this second slide. Paula will monitor this and provide any needed clarification and also interrupt me if needed to be, to, you know, to ask if, um, if I need to provide any further clarification. The session is being recorded and will be posted on Therapy Ed's YouTube channel. Um, the link to this post will be post on, pro, sent to the program directors directly and shared on the OT commune, OT student page and on Therapy Ed's Facebook page. The presentation from November, if you have colleagues who 
were not able to make it tonight and they were not able to make it on November 15th. The November 15th session is already recorded on their VEDS YouTube page. And if you can't find it on the page, you can go to CommunoT or ISCU Program Director for the direct link because I did post that. And it is available for the, the November 15th session. Okay. I do need to ask that there are no recordings allowed of this session, um, no audio, no video recordings. Again, we will make this public domain in, in a couple of weeks and you can have access to that. We also issue, you don't take any pictures or screenshots and particularly not storing or transmitting any information electronically or via Quizlet. That is a violation of copyright law and our profession's ethical standards. So I, I thank you in advance for your compliance with these guidelines. And the other thing I need to make note of is Therapy Ed is a separate company. We are not affiliated um, with the NBCOT, National Board for Certification in Occupational Therapy. NBCOT, OTR, and CODA are registered, registered trademarks and they are owned by the NBCOT. Okay, so what is our objectives tonight? I want to basically provide answers to the frequently asked questions that students on exam candidates have about the current 2024 certification exam format and content. Like Paul, I've been doing, you know, exam prep for a very, very long time. And every time there's a switch in the, switch in the exam format and content, anxiety increases. So one of our goals always in therapy ed is decreasing anxiety and letting you know that the test is manageable um, and doable. So I will be talking about what is gonna be expected in 2024 as far as the format of content. I will talk about the new six option multi-select scenario set items, which is new to the exam and replacing the clinical simulation test items, which have been on the exam since 209. And I will also talk about how the exam is administered and scored moving forward 2024. And I'm also gonna spend some time on the importance well, and the need you know, to obtain time. and use, oh, yeah. to obtain. Sorry, Rita, you just got muted. <clears throat> Good enough. Um, I am going to talk, take some time to talk about the need to obtain and use ADA accommodations if you're eligible. And I'll explain why that's so important, even if you've never used accommodations in your curriculum. And I'm also going to talk about the importance of being a critical consumer of exam preparation resources and products to make sure they are accurate and current and relevant and effective. You will often be bombarded. Many students say they get a lot of emails about a lot of information, and some of it is good and valid, and some of it is a bit questionable and may not be the best quality. And it also can get very, very expensive and be very stressful when you have multiple, multiple resources. I'm also gonna highlight strategies and resources for structuring an efficient review of your professional education to ensure you master the knowledge that's required for MBCOT exam success, so that you're studying efficiently and effectively, and also resources for effective test-taking strategies. We can know our content, but sometimes it's hard to figure out what is that right answer, that best out of three or four, the best three out of six. So that's the goals for this evening. All right, so let's get to the heart of matter. What's the format of the 2024 exam? Okay, the 2024 exam is comprised now of 180 multiple choices. No more CSTs, all multiple choices. Now the multiple choices have two types. The traditional three or four option single response where you pick one out of three or one out of four that you've seen since third grade and a six option multi-select scenario, okay? And that is going to be where you select three out of six and I'll have a screenshot in a minute, okay? There, the scenario sets are interspersed. There's no separate section anymore for any type of exam item. They're distributed throughout the exam and there's no predetermined a number of them, how many are traditional, how many are scenario sets. But the exam, the number of each is doable within the four hours. For, again, the three to four options, you pick the one. For the six option, you choose the three, most correct, the three that are correct. There is on neither of the, none of the exam items have any combination answers of like A and B, E, E, and F. You select each, you know, for the multiple choices. And even when they when they word the six options, 
each one is clean. It's not going to be a compound sentence. It's going to be a very clean and simple, you know, direct answer. Okay, so we're going to start. We'll just get right into doing a question. If people want to put in the chat box what you when you after you read this, what you think the correct answer is, okay, and then we'll review. So an occupational therapist provides services to enhance the independence and safety of residents of the skilled nursing facility. They perform periodic screening of fall risk, and fall risk is specified on the exam as knowledge you must know how to prevent falls. What is the primary purpose of this fall risk ass assessment? So if someone can venture into the chat box, I only, my philosophy when I do the um, therapy at courses is I only call on people who have correct answers because I like to have a strengths-based approach. So do we, do we think it's determining if environmental modifications are needed to decrease fall risk? Developing a balanced mobility intervention program for residents? Identify adaptations for resident safety in their while they do their ADL when they perform them? Or establish the need for an evaluation of their fall risk? So let's see what we have here. All right. They're going by so quickly. Sandra, you have the correct answer. Can you explain why you selected D is the correct answer, along with your peers. Everyone's getting this this correct. Do you mind unmuting what led you to decide that it was D? No. Well, we are at the screening stage of the occupational therapy process. And so at the beginning of the OT process, the only option that is reasonable is to make a determination that the therapist will do a more comprehensive assessment. Um, exactly. All the other answers are at a different stage of the process. Right. All the other answers are at the, the stage of intervention. So this is, whoops, went too fast. Hold on. All right, let me say, oh, okay. I, I thought I had a slide. I apologize that, has, that I, I put screening in green. Screening was the key word, knowing the OT process. So the important thing to know about the exam is it does test your foundational knowledge. Your foundational knowledge about the OT process is tested on the exam. So just knowing the OT process and that screening, the outcome screening is evaluation, you get the right answer. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a, a six option multi-select in which you are going to select, would select three. Now due to time constraints, I'm not going to go through this because this has a lot of dimensions to it. Okay. Because what you need to know here, so basically the way that I wanted to show this, that's how it's set up, is more the purpose of this. So all the scenario sets always have four sections, okay, four items related to, not sections. So it's a scenario set, and it's considered one item, but it has four items that follow it, okay? And each time you have a screen with an item in it, the opening information, the opening scene, the background information will be provided, okay? So here you have someone recovering well from a recent MI, nearing discharge. So again, the stage of the OT process is important. It's a second I, MI and they have COPD. So like subsequent items after this will probably address the COPD and other issues. But right now it's asking in anticipation of discharge, they've established intervention goals focused on developing skills needed to safely engage in desired home management and leisure activities. Which activities are best? Now, what you have to know about this is that you have to then understand that at discharge, someone who is has an MI, when they first have the MI, they're gonna do things that are very, very low in MET levels, okay? Um, very low in MET levels. So, that means they would be doing, when they first have their MI, they would be doing things like play, preparing meals and playing cards while seating, sewing with the use of a sewing machine and knitting, because that's also sitting, okay? Um, so they would do things that are at a lower MET level when they first have an MI. Pre-discharge, they have to be at a higher MET level. And again, the strategy you use is always right when third grade, you eliminate things that are wrong. So things that are too low, F, and things that are too low, B is too low, is out. They would not be correct for preparation for discharge. Person needs to be doing more. 
but then also something too high because after someone's discharged, they'll continue to have cardiac rehab. So something that's too high would be digging and planting in the garden and cycling. That would be too high. That would be for outpatient. So the correct answers are going to be things that are at a 3.5 MET level. So even if you haven't studied the MET levels, like we teach everyone in the course, now we have them in the review and study guide, and you should study them. But using your activity analysis skills can help you get the right answers by eliminating ones that are incorrect. So these would be the three correct answers for this item. So again, I'm using this as an example just to show how it works and how the test-taking skills that you use when you have a regular multiple choice of eliminating the wrong ones also works for this. So the strategies you, you have been using for a very long time to eliminate wrong answers works for this item. So, and this is now an example of the second one, okay? That, again, the same information would be up there and it's an exact repeat. But then this item two, it says during, while they're doing those home management activities, making the bed, the SPO2 rate drops. And based on this response, what should the therapist do during the session? So how do I respond when something drops? So again, you want to eliminate the obviously wrong ones. Like, I don't think we would, I think we would, if you read this, say, well, I'm not going to tell them, you know, that, you know, you can no longer perform, you know, making the bed or home management activity. We can address this through therapy. The person is just still in recovery, okay? And you don't want someone to perform the val valsalva maneuver because that's a holding. When someone's like picking, they hold their breath. And that is not, that is not, that's contraindicated for someone who has a, um, a, has had an MI, okay? And you probably don't want to do an exercise test, even though it says graded. What you do want to do is purse lip breathing, teach them also how to recognize the decreased vital capacity. So when I recognize it, I can stop the activity and use energy conservation techniques so I don't even need to go into purse lip breathing. But right now in the session, I want them to do purse lip breathing. Then I need to educate them about signs. And then as a therapist, I need to also periodic monitor, you know, monitor their exertion. So again, this is, and again, three, three out of the six will be correct. And you gain points for everyone that is correct. So on the MBCOT exam, the MBCOT exam is a fair exam. You never lose points for incorrect answers. So never leave a blank. Like if I did not know what the board, you know, if I say I knew purse lip breathing was good and I knew D was good, but I wasn't sure about the Val Salvo or the Borg dispersion, the, the spinning scale, guess. You may guess right. Okay. And particularly if you're if you have four options and you eliminate one or you only get three options, you have a 33% chance of getting right. Even four, you have 25%. You limit one thirty three percent. You eliminate two. How many times do you get down to that? You're between two. It's a fifty percent chance of getting it right. Those are good odds. So never leave a blank on the exam. A very good thing about the MBCOT exam is you can mark your answers and go back. Okay, so you can mark it and go back because you may get a hint later on, or you may you know say I'm taking too much time in this. I don't want to overthink it. Let me finish the exam and let I can go back. Okay. Now an important thing also to know about the exam is that all items are not scored, okay? The MBCOT field test items to, to make sure that they're operational and valid before they actually count them. And they're interspersed between the items. There are no identified characteristics to tell you which ones are being field tested versus scored. So you must answer every item as it counts. But I always advise students is, if you do see a question and you're just not sure, it just doesn't sound right to you. you know, every, have you ever taken an exam and, and it's just quite a question you don't like, you know, and it makes you uncomfortable and you get a little concerned about it? I say use this to your benefit. Say to yourself, you know what, it's probably not going to count. And the reality is it may be true. If there's a question that's just not written that well or clear, it probably isn't going to count because you have to understand the MBCOT exam is a fair exam. Every single item is written by an item writer who has to submit their qualifications and they have to be judged to be an expert in the field. They then get training in how to write good items. They get a mentor. They 
write items, they get peer reviewed, they get revised, they get peer reviewed again, and then they go on the exam and they don't even count. So by the time an exam is actually counting towards your score, it's a very well-written item, okay? So if you do get those items that we all periodically on a test do, that we just don't like them, they don't sit with us, breathe, so you know what? Probably not gonna count. And you can't do that for 45 items, but those couple that just are nudging you the wrong way, let it go, because it probably is true they're not gonna count, okay? And then the score basically is used, they use the statistical procedures to convert the results into a scale score, which goes from 300 to 600 with 450 passing. A lot of times people want us to explain it. And to be honest, it's very complicated. I did ask a, a wonderful professor at the University of Scranton um, who has since retired, but Dr. Hogan could explain everything very easily. And he just said, it really was too complicated. Just let everyone know it's fair. And if you think about how the SAT is scored and the GRE are scored, they're also with large numbers. They're not like 85%, 90% ABC kind of rating scale. So it is, it is scored fairly. So just be aware of that. And you're always moving forward, gaining points. They never take away points. Okay, so what's the bottom line on the 2024 exam? It's, it's less intimidating and it's much more test friendly. It definitely is. 2024 exam, much less intimidating, much more test taken friendly. What am I basing that conclusion on? Rather than having to answer yes or no to a varying number of answer choices that are in the current exam, the CST items could have anywhere from six options to up to 12 options. And you never knew when you went from the four, one, one to two to three to the fourth section, how many options they were gonna be. So that kind of made people anxious. Now in the course, we taught people strategies so they knew how to approach it in a way that was manageable and they could succeed. But if people didn't take the therapy course and didn't know, that can cause some anxiety. And also, if you know your timing is a little off, it can make you a little anxious because they were all at the beginning. And so you knew you had to get through all three CST items when in a certain amount of time to be able to finish the rest of the test. So there was that also extra anxiety. The other thing, so now they're interspersed. So there's no timing issue. Okay. So instead of answering yes or no to maybe six to 12, it's very clean. Everything you know has six options and you're going to answer three. So there's no, how, if I have, you know, eight options, is it five yes, three no, five no, three yes, four and four. So some that, that um, variability made some people anxious. So now you don't have that. It's very clear. Three out of six, interspersed. And the nicest part, the really very user-friendly thing that makes it less intimidating is you can now mark, return to a reviewing exam item and change your answer if you want for the entire test. Prior on the CST items, you could not return to CST item sections. And once you picked yes, it was yes, you could not change it. Once you picked no, it was no, you could not change it. The philosophy of that was, was that in practice, you can't say, I didn't do that, do over. So that's why, because they were called clinical simulation items. So you cannot change your answer. Now you can change your answer for any of the items. You had that three option and you knew two of them, but you didn't know the third one. So you guessed and at the end of the exam, you have 15 minutes left. You say, let me go back and look at that and think about it some more. Let me analyze those activities. Okay, and figure out what's that third activity. So you have that option now. So it's much more test friendly, much, much more, less intimidating. So it's a fair exam and it's always been a fair exam and now it's gotten less intimidating. Okay, so how, what do you need to know? What's the content? So the way the MBCOT decides the content is they survey practicing OTRs to determine the core tasks that comprise entry-level practice and the knowledge required to perform their tasks. And based on practice analysis, they construct the exam content outline and create specifications and let the item writers know these are the things we need to test on the exam. An important thing to know is that the MBCOT considers entry-level practice practitioners be those who have been credentialed for 36 months or less. So from the first day that you work up to three years, you're considered entry-level. And entry-level practice is considered generalist. What is required for entry-level practice? It is not advanced or specialized knowledge. Sometimes I get people emailing me saying, well, I have this other resource that I was looking at, an exam prep resource, and it has the NICU. 
we don't have anything about the NICU. And we don't have anything about the NICU because the NICU is considered a specialized practice. Okay. Anything that requires certification, advanced education is not on the exam. It is generalist knowledge. And you could look at the MBCOT practice analysis at mbcot.org. It's right on their website. As is the content outline. Okay. So what is the test? Well, you need to know. There's four domains, and these four domains have been around for a long time. The, the language changed a little bit with each, each item, you know, each outline and each new exam, but they fundamentally test the same thing. And then under each domain, so there's four, and under each domain, they identify tasks, and then they identify what you need to know to perform that task competently and safely. So that's how the exam content outline is, best, is set up. Domains task and a knowledge statement. And this is an example from domain one. You can access the complete content outline at mbcot.org. You basically click on what's on the exam and then what's on the exam and it goes right to the content outline. So these are the 2024 content outline um, and their percentages. Domain one is 23%. Domain two is to also 23%. So this is evaluation assessment. This is my of the evaluation and my intervention planning. 38% is my intervention implementation. And then 16% is competency practice management. And those are the indirect services, the things that you do guided by you know, evidence. So my research, my evidence-based practice, but regulatory practice, compliance and standards of practice. So things like being HIPAA compliant, quality assurance, documentation standards, Medicare reimbursement standards, and those are all covered in chapter four of, of the review and study guide. All right, so what do you need to know? In domain one, these are the three task statements. These are the task statements. Task one, identify the influence of development. Task two, assess people's roles and prioritize needs and performance context. And task three, perform an activity analysis to determine the influence of tasks and context on occupation. So those are domain one tasks, there's three of them. So then under the domain one, the tasks, there's nine knowledge statements. So there's nine specific knowledge statements. And what I'm doing, there's no way I can go through the complete 14 pages of the OTR content outline, you know, in an hour. What I did was I highlighted the one that either have been around for a long time, but gives students sometimes the most concern about how they're gonna prepare for it. And I'm also highlighting some of the new ones that are, or some of the specifics that were added to the to the new content outline. So domain one, this knowledge statement of impact on development has been for a long time. As you can see, chapter five covers all areas of development from cognitive to play to sensory motor. And it also covers all things related to aging. So all the content you need to know is there. I want to bring up, and this is new for the 10th edition, we have added a table about the CDC guidelines because I frequently get questions of people asking, well, do I, you know, if you don't have the CDC guidelines and we didn't put them, you know, we didn't have them in the book because they weren't published at the time that NBCOT published the exam. You have to realize when NBCO publishes an exam, like they published in 2019, that exam is the same from 2019 to 2023. So when this came out in 2020, 2021, it was, it, it did not have any impact on the exam. But the thing to know about the CC, CDC guidelines, and there is someone who does a podcast about exam preparation. And, you know, he, he doesn't charge and it's called OT Prepper. And if you know, if you like Harry Potter and you know Harry Potter and um, Star Wars very well, you will probably understand a lot of his mnemonics because that's what he uses. And basically he's sharing what he used to prepare for the exam, which is fine. The one thing though, that is, is really not the best advice is he does advise people because there's so much in development. He advises people just to study the CDC guidelines. That is not good advice. So be careful about that. This is statements that were made by the, a the AOTA when the CDC guidelines came out. This is based upon that and also based upon what the CDC is. CDC says about these. These are surveillance checklists. That's all they are. They checklist. Now they do have benefits. They decrease the wait and see. You know, they have that, you know, more people can be aware of what's expected. So it's great for parents and caregivers and pe pediatricians. It's, it's fantastic. 
but they do not replace screening by a professional. They are not diagnostic tools. They do not replace all the evaluations we do for reflexes, sensory motor, cognition, play, social. They're not a replacement for what we do as OT practitioners. And the MBCOT tests what we are expected to do in practice. So you do need to know the content if you're going to answer, you know, to answer any questions about the role of OT in development, working with kids, evaluation, intervention. Okay. So be aware of that. Okay. So another test, another knowledge statement that is under domain one is looking at the internal external factors influence the client's engagement in occupation. So I'm highlighting just a couple of the key ones. And what's different in the new content outline for the 2024 exam is these, this statement of internal and external factors influence the client's engagement in occupation. That's been around for a long time. That has not changed. What has changed is they now give examples. And these issues, role habits, routines used to be in that statement. Now they have it as an example. And now they specifically say me medication side effects and interactions. So in our review and study guide, and we have this in the current edition and we have more going forward for the 10th edition, we have caution boxes that highlight for you things you need to be aware of. And one of them, and a lot of these caution boxes relate to medications. So for example, this is in chapter 10 in the psychiatric chapter that talks about that a complication that occur with second generation antipsychotics is the development of met metabolic syndrome and describes what metabolic syndrome is. And basically there's serious risk factors for heart disease and stroke. And chapter nine goes into more information about metabolic syndrome. So we, we do that too, we link between the two chapters. But this way, when you see it as a caution box, know this, you, you must know this. And this one is from chapter eight, the cardiopulmonary chapter. Knowing that, you know, if you take these anti-inflammatory drugs, body may take longer. So you have to be aware of the precaution that if someone does cut themselves in a cooking group and they're on this, this drug, that you need to be very conscious that they may, you know, bleed excessively. And in that chapter, we in um we have about in the risk management management section of chapter four, we have how do you handle internal external bleeding? And that's another thing that's specifically listed as an example. So just wanted to show. <clears throat> where in the review and study guide, and this is true for both the ninth and the 10th edition, chapter 10 covers all the sign, the, the diagnoses from DSM 5 TR. And in this section for each of these, it will talk about the medications that are relevant to that chapter. Okay. Last night, I did an online office hour session about risk management. And, you know, I showed the slides that we have about MAOI inhibitors and how they can spike blood pressure. And, and cause serious damage. And then chapter 14 goes into all the psychosocial frames of reference, our models of practice, interdisciplinary models of practice, such as um, cognitive behavioral therapy, recovery, psychosocial rehabilitation. It covers all the assessments you will need to know and all the intervention approaches and the special considerations for psychosocial evaluation. And that includes things like suicide, domestic and intimate partner violence, Domestic abuse, it covers things like challenging behaviors, how do you manage hallucinations, how do you manage self-destructive behavior, how do you man manage delusions, escalating behavior. So all the things you need to know about how you would answer a question in about psychosocial evaluation intervention is in chapter 14. All right, what else do you need to know? Um, influence of lived experience and identity on occupational performance. That's the, that's the statement, the knowledge statement. But here is the example, history of trauma and adverse childhood events. This is new for 2024. And, whoops, okay. And we have this, and we have always had in the review and study guides from the very first edition, because when I worked in mental health, many, many of my clients were living with and surviving domestic abuse and interpartment, but intimate partner violence. And I always covered that in my courses. And we also provide comprehensive information about child, elder, patient abuse. So it's in the book. And we include sign prevalence, definitions, signs, and OT's practitioner roles, our legal responsibility for children 
on the Child Abuse Pre Prevention and Treatment Act is in chapter four. And our intervention for guy approaches and resources and referrals are covered for all of those. And the radar approach is the one that I've always instructed students to use, but now it's saying they want, they you need to know the history of trauma and adverse childhood effects and trauma is definitely domestic abuse and violence. So what would you do if you have a question that asks about that? Well, using the radar approach is an excellent way to guide you in selecting the best answer. And that's table 14.3. Right. As I, from the beginning, we said they want to know about your expected patterns of performance. So I want to use this as an example that throughout the, the book, we refer back to these clear, these knowledge statements and we link it to the content in the chapter. So look in patterns, progression, prognosis with conditions that limit occupational performance, signs, symptoms of disease, stages of disease, secondary complications. Well, if you review the information in chapter 10 about schizophrenia and the other psychotic disorders in the following, you will then be able to know the functional impact and correctly answer exam items. Okay. Um, now we have comprehensive information because this is a very generic, covers all conditions. Okay. So there's comprehensive information about all body systems disorders in Chapter six covers all your musculoskeletal system disorders, everything from carpal tunnel to hip fractures, okay? Chapter seven covers all your neurological disorders from traumatic brain injury to multiple sclerosis to ALS, critic ataxia, all, the, all, all those neurological. Chapter eight covers all the cardiopulmonary from MI to tuberculosis to cystic fibrosis, okay? And chapter nine covers all the other body systems. So everything from swallowing disorders and dysphagia to AIDS, to heat, um, heat syndromes, to pressure ulcers and, um, and wounds. So it covers all those. So those, those, that's where all your diagnostic information is for that. So what else do you need to know? Task two, domain two. Task one is synthesizing those assessment results, again, analyzing. Task two is collaborating with the client and others and using your therapeutics itself. Task three is monitoring and modifying the intervention plan. Okay. So what do you need to know for these tasks? The knowledge for those three task statements are, there's 12 of them. So again, I'm highlighting. And one of them, as we know, when we analyze our evaluation, our, one of our goals is to interpret and you know complete an occupational profile. And if you're working with a population, it's you know figuring out the outcome of the needs assessment. So box three, two has questions, all the questions for obtaining an occupational profile. Okay. All the questions needed for obtaining an occupational profile. One of the client's reasons for seeking services, what do they value? What's important? What's their priority? What's their skills, client factor performance patterns? And then it's longer, it didn't fit in the space. It includes additional questions to obtain their occupational history and to understand their personal and environmental factors that may hinder their engagement. So it has all the questions for all aspects of formulating an occupational profile. That's in chapter three. I do encourage people to begin with start with chapter three because it covers all that foundational information you need. The OT process will remind you that the outcome screening is evaluation. So it goes through screening, evaluation, intervention, the use of your clinical and professional reasoning, therapeutic use of self was in one of those, those knowledge statements. Occupation, activity analysis and synthesis, we saw that was another example there. A lot of information about groups and therapeutic groups, and then the next stages are, are of our OT process, intervention review and discharge planning and transition and discontinuation. As I mentioned during the online office hours last night, we cover, we have the CDC guidelines for standard precautions and transmission-based precautions that will be on the exam, okay? And then chapter four covers all the indirect services and the competency and practice management skills from ethics to supervision, to working on the team, payment, Medicare, documentation, legislation, it's a lot. Our community-based models, our institution-based models, 
all our service management from budget budget to quality assurance, needs assessment, program evaluation, and then risk management, which includes a new item, which I will um, show in a minute. Okay. So under domain three, four, you need to know the proportions of contraindications associated with the client's condition. And that includes laboratory values and suicidal ideation. So this is an example of where we talk about laboratory values, okay? Um, and that's in chapter eight. Now, I'm gonna do a little pu public service announcement and a little plug for the New York State OT Association. On January 16th, they are having a webinar on suicide prevent for suicide prevention training, which you can earn your QPR. QPR is the mental health version of CPR. What QPR stands for is question. If you think someone is having suicidal ideation, you question them. Do you feel like hurting yourself? We teach this in, in the therapy of um, exam prep course. The next, the P is persuade. Let me get you help. How can I help you? You know, I want to access, you know, get you to get help so that you don't hurt yourself. And then refer, knowing that if a person declines to be helped, that maybe you need to call an ambulance. Maybe they need to go to a psychiatric ER. Maybe you need to call the suicide prevention hotline, 988, okay? So this is a wonderful opportunity. For those of you who are New York State OT members, it would be $8. For non-members, it's $20, but it is open to anyone who wants to be part of it. And you just go onto Nersoda's website. Okay. But it is, it's helpful for the exam. I mean, we cover it very well in the book. All this information is, is covered in the book, but it, it's really good to uh, hear and learn from someone who is an expert. Excuse me. It's, it's iced tea. I realize I have iced tea in a wine glass. I like to do that. <laughs> it's iced tea. Um, so they just, you know, it's on the exam, but this is an opportunity to learn more for your practice. Okay, so I, I wanted to put that out there. All right, what do you also you need to know under domain three? Um, task one, oh, that, that one, I'm sorry, that one went for, to domain four. Now we're back to domain three. I apologize for that. But there was an opportunity there to put in about the um, suicide prevention. All right, task one, incorporating preparatory, there's five tasks under this one. Preparatory techniques, so physical agent modalities, um, occupation-based strategies, okay, all your your ADLs, all your areas of occupation, so including sleep, rest, work, and what are my interventions to help Im improve and attain goals, okay? So there are the knowledge statements. Okay, there are three tasks, 29 statements, so that's where they have a lot. One is about orthoses, okay? General analysis and orthotic selection, design, and fabrication. This has always been on the exam in the 10th edition, We've expanded by having some very nice pictures. Okay, all the evaluation and intervention approaches you need to know for biomechanicals in chapter 11. Chapter 12 covers all your neurological. Chapter 13, your cognitive perceptual. So the, this is where you'll find the information you need for domain three to answer domain three items. Okay, an example statement under domain three is knowing your indications, contraindications, and proportion for wound management. So we have a nice figure that shows you the different stages of the wound, stages of wound um, healing, and also the factors. So the whole prevention by knowing what the factors are, and we talk about how you can help deal with prevent the sequela if people have these risk factors, how do you prevent wounds from developing? Another item that has been on the exam for quite a while, and you know, students are often seeking information about this, is ergonomics and universal design and reasonable accommodations. Principles of universal design is in table in chapter 16 and table 16.1. And this is in the current text also, but I added examples. And I also greatly expanded upon them using uh, multiple resources because that definitely is an area of practice, particularly with everyone aging in place. And aging in place is now mentioned specifically on the 2024 exam. So we expanded the universal design because that's one of the best ways for people to age in place. And then reasonable accommodations. Chapter 15 has a very good table about reasonable accommodations to enable performance at work. And chapter four has all the ADA um, legal standards for reasonable accommodations. And as you can see, 15 covers 
ADL, IADL, health management, family participation, play leisure, education work, rest and sleep. So it covers all those things that's listed in that knowledge statement. And then in the environment, we cover all your wheelchair, home safety, low vision in the environment, which is definitely also noted on the exam, and all your mobility aids, wheelchair transfers, assistive technology. Okay. Do know, again, under domain three, contraindications for the physical agent modalities, okay? And the contraindications for your deep thermal and physical. And these are red flag boxes, and these are throughout the chapter of all the chapters of things that you really need to watch out for because you can cause harm. So pay attention to the red flags, okay? Because you will need to, the exam will definitely ask you things in the caution and red flag boxes because remember the MBCOT exam is the licensure exam for every state, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Washington, DC. And state licensure boards want to make sure that you know how to be safe. So pay attention to the red flags. Another domain three is about our low and high tech technology and all our different ways of interfacing with that technology. And this is an example of a, ta a box that covers all the different ways and it goes for a whole much, it has extra information also. I ended here because that's where it fit. But all the different ways people can access a computer via keyboards, okay? And that would be something that would be on the exam as far as high tech and how you're able to access those, okay? Domain four has these tasks, and this is again, the non-direct the non um, direct service types of things, evidence-based strategy, risk management, that you're complying with practice acts and accreditation guidelines and reimbursement requirements, and professional role development and competency assessment. So I'll highlight a few things here. Okay, so what do you need to know? There are 12 statements for the domain four tasks, and as I mentioned, aging in place and fall prevention. As you see, there's a bit of overlap between universal design and, you know, and then risk management and fall prevention, you know, those types of things. But, um, oops. So we do have in chapter 16 also, what are the risk factors for falls? Because to know the risk factors is how you prevent them. Okay. So universal design enables aging in place. They also want to make sure that, you know, the evidence-based approaches help people age in place and prevent falls. Okay, the other thing that's on the, the exam and what you need to know as knowledge is how to locate, review, critically appraise, and critically appraise scholarly research. And they do um, identify doing a, a, a PICO, I think is the way you pronounce it, but the Population Intervention Comparison Outcome. And this box includes all the steps in that critical appraisal topic process. Domain four also requires you to know your reimbursement. Do know that on the exam, they can't ask you about private insurance, okay? They, because every state can vary in the insurances and people's insurance policy can value, but they can ask you about Medicare because Medicare is a national insurance. So we have this information in the current text, but it's in the outline format. This time I was able to, I had the time to be able to break up into boxes so it's easier to see. So we have a box for part A, a box for part B, a box for durable medical equipment, and a box for what is homebound status and how is someone homebound and what are the rules for that. So pay attention to these because Medicare will definitely be on the exam. This is new. Okay. This is now, as far as your professional competency, one of the knowledge you need to know is how to prevent professional burnout. And we have, because I always taught this in my professional development classes, because I think it's it's critical to, to know how to prevent that from happening. Um, so we have here the preventing burnout for the individual, but then underneath this section, there's guidelines for preventing burnout, what supervisors can do and what administrators can do. Okay, so that's what you need to know. Um, it's a lot, okay? MBCOT exam measures the depth and breadth of OT practice. So the bottom line is you do need to know a lot. But you need to remember that if you are preparing for this exam, you have earned the status of being an exam candidate. Paula always makes a point to saying that. You are no longer a student. You, are, you have to prove that you are graduated from the accredited OT graduate program to be able to apply for the exam. So you have earned the status of being an exam candidate. Congratulations. 
to accomplish this, you had to pass a lot of hard and challenging, you know, coursework and field work. So you clearly know a lot and have the skills. Do you want guidance to do this effectively? Of course. Fortunately, you know, Paul and I have been working with Therapy Ed now for, you know, 20, 25 years, um, you know, doing this. So we have the, the, there is the experience to help you make this a doable practice process. Now, before I go into resources to help you prepare effectively, efficiently, I wanted to briefly review why you need to take the testing accommodations to you to do testing. Oh, here are the resources I will be reviewing. The review and study guide with three online practice exam, exam prep courses, the test prep app, individual and group tutoring, which Paul is one of our tutors, online office hours, which are free every week, exam mine week on social media, and things that we record and post on YouTube. So why should you take you know, a combination. People ask, I have a disability, but did not use the combination to take tests during my program. Should I apply? Yes, most definitely yes. Well, I know this decision is very personal and it's based upon what your experience has been in school. And many times people don't use them during OT education. However, it's very important to recognize that this experience may not be generalizable to the MBCOT exam. The content format and test taking experience differs from course specific exams. So this is straight out of a, a screenshot from the book. We advise you to do it because here's why I did an activity analysis, activity demands analysis and environmental evaluation comparing the course exam, your course exams and your curriculum with the MBCOT exam. And very briefly, basically your course exams will be whatever that, that course content is, PEDS, business, psychosocial, okay? There's limited cognitive shifts because you're focused on one topic. They're usually in that familiar pick one out of three or four. And they typically request recall of knowledge. And if you do have a comprehensive exam at the end, it's based upon tests or quizzes you've done before. The MECOT exam is very different. It's the depth and breadth. It covers everything that you learned in your curriculum and probably some things that maybe there wasn't time to cover, okay? So there's a lot of cognitive shifts that are required. Each one is unique. There's 180 different unique foci. So you, it's, it takes much more cognitive shifts. You also have that very novel four section six, six option, which is unfamiliar. And they're not just purely testing your knowledge. They will add things like screening, acute care. What I do in acute care is very different than home care because I only have two to three days to do it. So you have to you know, learn how to pay attention to those nuances and have the time to do it. The other thing is the environment is different. You're, a lot of times now people are taking their exams at home or in dorm rooms because people are doing it because post-COVID we learned we can. Or if you take it in the classroom, it's where it's a familiar environment. You have your favorite desk. You get to sit down. You self-select. You're with your peers. They're coming and going at the same time. When you go to take your exam in Pearson, you're going to have to go through a security check. You don't get to pick your own computer. And people are coming and taking many different tests at different times. So we strongly urge you to, to do get the accommodations. They adhere to ADA guidelines. The testing accommodations book is very clear about how you get them. An important thing to know about Pearson, BU, they allow these comfort items, including ergonomic position supplies, mobility devices, all these things are allowed. You could go to Pearson site and see that are allowed without needing an accommodation. But we strongly urge you. All right, so briefly, as I'm going to go through these slides and then be open for questions, just to review if some of you are not familiar with our resources. Our review and study guides are now in the 10th edition, and they're authored by content experts. If you look at, you know, everyone who authors for and contributes to the book are people who've taught and practiced in, in the content that they, are, that they are updating. Therefore, because they are active educators with and knowledgeable about this content, they make sure it's very current and accurate and that it fully covers the information you need. The review and study guide comes with three practice exams that mirror the OTR exam. So you get opportunities to practice what you study. We always advise people study first. No need to take a practice exam to tell you you need to study. You know you need to study. Okay, and, if you, and I'll show the course what you get in the course. And we also have in chapter, in the chapters, you know, information about test taking and time management strategies. Chapter one covers all the information you need to know about the exam, okay, and how to answer the different questions. And chapter two covers all the things on how to do an effective exam preparation plan and how to use your critical reasoning. Um, the book is big. 
okay? All the now rationales for the exams are now online, so it's not quite as thick as before, but because we've added many tables, boxes, and figures to highlight must-know information, the chapters have gotten a bit longer. We also have, so close to 300 of those, 287 exam hint boxes that has that relationship, as I showed you the picture, of how the content relates to the um, content outline. 152 caution boxes and 66 red flag boxes. So you can't miss what you need to know to that you need to make sure that you're being cautious of in an exam item. At the end of chapters three to 16, there's open-ended content review questions. And here's a couple examples of those. Um, and they just basically for you jumpstart to think about what did I learn in this chapter? And did I learn what I need to learn? Um, they're meant to help you think through the knowledge and kind of make that transition from thinking, you know, narrative wise and thinking, you know, what, how thinking like a practitioner on field work, and then what is the book knowledge I need to apply to take a test before you get into the objective exam items. They're a very good resource for study groups, you know, for people to answer them and then discuss. And the answers are in the back of the book in the appendix. Okay. The Therapy Ed Reading Study Guide includes a portal that has access for 12 months, which will contain three exams that are designed to simulate the MBCOD exam. For 2024 and 2024, there will be in the format of 180 items that include what we just covered, the three different types, and they'll be distributed throughout. And they do have guidelines on how to use those. And you get very detailed score report, reports that can help you with your exam preparation plan. Immediately after you complete exam, the score report pops up. It will tell you how long you took to take the exam, the items you answered correctly and incorrectly, and the percentage you answered correctly according to those four domains, five critical reasoning skills, and nine content categories that, ca that align with the chapter so you know what to study. When you receive the report, you will be able to click on the rationale and we'll go, you know, click right when you go on to the item, it will be immediately linked to a detailed explanation about the rationale, why you, it was correct, why the other answers were wrong. And it, and it will also tell you and give you a, the ability through artificial intelligence of, it has frequently asked questions. Like for example, what is peripheral neuropathy? The question was about some peripheral neuropathy. And you could click on that and get information from leading textbooks about what is peripheral neuropathy. You can click on what causes peripheral neuropathy. And then you could put in your own question. Can peripheral neuropathy be, you can type in your own question and we'll generate an answer for you also. Okay. Now what is unique to therapy ed is the five critical reasoning skills and the nine content knowledge categories. No other um, practice exams cover those. And what's really unique in chapter two, we provide you guidelines on how to use that score report so you can revise your exam preparation plan. So here in box two one, we talk about when you see your domains, if they're less than satisfactory, what should you do? We should look at those exam hints and prioritize your studying to study what we know is on the exam. You know, everything in the book is on the exam, but some things are really highlighted. And to learn more, you can go to look at the content outline that NBCOT posts. We also talk about if your critical reasoning is low, what do you do? Chapter two has very comprehensive information about how to apply critical reasoning. It's been expanded to have even some problem solving and activities that Kara Inda has developed to develop your critical reasoning skills and have deep more thinkly, think more deeply. And there's questions in um, table two seven to help you reflect. For your content category, these are the nine categories. And as you can see, they relate to the exam, um, to the chapter titles. And basically, you know, to do that, you really wanna look at all the rationales identify your gaps and revise it using, and there's information in table two five, which is, which is this table, that lines up. So you can tell you exactly which chapters you need to study if you're low in a certain area. So it's very focused and um, very efficient. So basically to conclude about the review and study guide, they're very efficient because it's one single text that has all the content and synthesizes it. So to simplify your preparation and save, and, and save time, it's also economical because one product has it all. And so it covers all the information you need with one product, has this content review question, has effective time management and test taking strategies, and has those ex examines what rationale and guidelines on how you use that knowledge.
Now, an important thing to remember is there's two aspects to exam certification exam success. One is mastering that content via the target study plan and figuring out the, the correct answer to the exam item. Therapy as course covers both. They offer it online and on campus. They include moving forward, it will include the 10th edition, currently includes the 9th edition. It includes a course manual that basically is a guide and walks you through the book and has a lot of study hints and forms for you to do self-assessment. And here's an example of the self-assessment form. Chapter five is often daunting. There's a lot of development. So basically the manual walks you through on how to evaluate things you know well and know adequately will be things you study, things you know a little, or I mean, think, know well and adequately you'll review, things you know a little or not at all is things you will study. So the, the manual walks you through on how to complete these assessments for each chapter so you have an efficient and effective study plan. Okay, they are taught by educators with 30 to 40 years of experience and they provide current information about the OTR exam so you know what's expected. The best part about the course is it's very active learning. We, we give you guidelines and strategies and then we practice and you learn and use strategies and practice them on how to break down and analyze items for both the single response and the multi-select items. Throughout the course, we emphasize time and stress management strategies so people stay focused and can complete the exam in a timely manner without undue stress. And we guide you through the use of the manual. The courses are effective and they work. Um, the course fee includes the review and study guide, which has those practice exams. If you already have the review and study guide, the price is deducted. And basically in 2022, you know, 98% of the 2,183 people who completed the eval said that they would recommend the course. And basically we go back to a lot of schools for over 20 years and program directors and deans are pretty astute about their budgets as our students. So they wouldn't waste their time if, if, if it didn't work, to be honest. All right, Therapy Ed also does have a mobile test prep app. So you can take the exams on, the, you know, items on the go, as many as you want or desire. They can be filtered according to those things that you scored on. And you can basically, you know, use the app to test your knowledge in areas that, you know, and to do that before you take the practice exams and review and study guide, and then can increase your efficacy of your preparation plan. Therapy Ed does one-on-one -on -one tutoring and group tutoring. And Paula, as I mentioned, is is a is one of our tutors. And I don't know, Paul, if you want to take a minute just to um, cover these points, if you don't mind. I don't mind. So um, I've, I've been answering some questions along the way, but um, so the tutoring is a, a fee for service and it's scheduled between who we have three different tutors and um, whoever's requesting the tutoring services. You can make those appointments online and find all the information at therapyed.com. And what's really fun about doing the personalized tutoring is that it really is very much individualized. So I've done the tutoring with small groups, with uh, groups from academic programs, when the academic program is the one driving the process and asking for the services. And um, also one-on-one -on -one with people. So we, I usually start out with like, what resources are you using? What are you doing now? Um, let's come up with a plan and move on to like, what are really your needs? Most of the time I find out from people what they want tutoring on is how do I break down those questions? How do I really understand what they're asking? And how do I get better at selecting the best answer for the traditional multiple choice? And um, the CSTs didn't present as many difficulties to people in the past. We'll see what happens with the multi-select scenario sets. Um, and so, Rita, I also want to take just a second. People have been asking about the scenario sets. So there's no designated number or percentage of the scenario sets. No. And they're no. going to be interspersed throughout the exam. Yes, they're interspersed throughout the exam. I anticipate because they did not increase the time. You know, the exam is still four hours. And they've increased the 170 multiple choices to 10 to 180. So if they they advise, had always advised that the CST items to complete the exam with the 170 items should you should take between 30 and 36 minutes to complete those CST items to finish the exam in a timely manner. It basically was like 11 minutes per CST item. So like so 30 to 33 minutes to complete that. So if they're doing using that same timing, it's going to be four hours. My thought is there's probably going to be about five 
of the, the six option because they're only adding, you know, 10 items total. So they're not adding 10 of them because that would take longer. So because you have to take like two minutes for like the first scene to read and then like a minute and a half for the others. So if you figure that it's about six minutes, six to seven minutes to complete one and divide that six minutes into 30 minutes, that's five of them. Divide seven minutes, that's, you know, just um, six. So, so yeah, six minutes, yeah, that's five, right? Five times six is 30. So, so there's probably going to be about maybe five or six of them on it. And that, that's probably it. You know, it's not going to be, you know, it'll be more than three CSTs, but also they are only six options. They don't go into 12 options. Okay. They're not going into 12 options. So, so that's why you now have that. Um, it's just 180 items. The most important thing I wanted, I hope, does it, I hope did that answer the question. Okay, I hope so. If not, we can, we can revisit that. Um, one thing I really want to say, like Paula said, the, the tutoring is very individualized. I know Paula says often someone, a lot of times people just do one or two to get on track, but important thing to know is therapy ed will never contact you to sell you more sessions. They are not going to be emailing you, asking you to buy packages. You determine when you want a session, you determine how many you want and need. Okay. And I think that's very important. Okay. Office hours are open every Tuesday night from seven to eight. When you're preparing, they include target review of foundational knowledge. They're relevant to OT and OTA. And basically, Paula, I, and our colleagues, you know, will who will be presenting a formal presentation, and then there's time to answer ask questions about anything. And these are these are the topics. Um, last night I did risk management. Okay, the generally they follow the sequence, but of course things change based upon availability. But they're all posted on Therapy Ed's um, website. Okay, we have a YouTube channel, and I have to update this to include the session we did in November. But you can go and look at the recordings of the online office hours. They're generally posted two weeks after the session, and they stay online for um, one month, which should say four weeks. Um, and the application of mindfulness, which is a very nice presentation by Donna Costa, which is the live one is coming up soon. Um, it's very good because it talks about be mindful during the exam preparation and be mindful when you take the exam. And then there's other sessions I did for like AOTA Inspire at New York State OT Association. There's an exam item of the week that is posted on Thursdays. The answer is given on Sundays. And we discuss it during the office hours on Tuesdays. And the content expert will be there to answer questions about it. All right, before we move on to more questions, I just wanted to do a summary in case people wind up, they have to leave. The one thing I want to say, no matter what products you use, I hope the information I provide about the 2024 exam is helpful and that I highlighted some things that will, will help you know what's the content of the exam, but I also hope that I help you decrease your stress about it. It really is a doable exam. And I think the, the response to the six option, um, three, select three, is going to be very favorable because you can change your answers. You can go back and review. They're interspersed, so there's not this, this pressure, and you know exactly what to expect. And you can use that process of elimination as you did for the, the traditional ones. So what I, I want you to, to really reflect before you buy any product is to first say, is it giving you current and accurate, accurate information about the content format and procedures? Anytime anybody says anything that the exam is tricky or hard or impossible to pass or anything that makes you anxious, be cautious. That's not a, that's not a reputable product. It's not true. The exam is challenging, but you've gotten here due to skills. So the exam is doable and is fair. You want to make sure the information is comprehensive and well-organized and well-integrated so that it directly relates to the content outline. You want to make sure that it teaches you effective test-taking and time management strategies so you can pick the correct items and complete it within the allotted time. And you want to make sure the practice exams accurately reflect the different types of exam items. We are doing going through peer review now of our updated exam items to make sure that they meet our rigorous standards, okay? And um, I can assure you when they are available, they will be very solid and mirror the MBCOT ex exam very, very, very closely um, and provide you with solid experience. We also provide through our course very real-time experiential learning opportunities. And then the individualized live supports through tutoring, through our courses and through our online office hours. Most important, check you know who are the providers if you go onto our our website and you look at who our instructors are i'm very very proud to 
pull these individuals, um, my colleagues. They're very experienced, well-regarded educators. We have people who are fellows, the AOTA. Many of us have published and presented nationally, internationally, and or most important, have given service to the profession. Our state association, AOTA, our communities, and our, and our institutions. So I'm very, very proud of the service record and the integrity and ethics of the Therapia team. So I'm proud of the quality of products and again, the expertise and integrity of our instructors. So I do think you would be able to answer firmly yes to these questions if you look at Therapy Ed. And I hope some of the things I showed you and what Paula has talked about the tutoring um, supports that. Okay, for those of you who are going to need to leave, I do thank you for your attention. And we look forward to working with you to effectively pass and succeed on the MBCOT OTR exam. And we wish you a rewarding career as an occupational therapist. And I'm going to go back to questions now and see if there are other questions. And Paul, if you could call out other ones that maybe you would like me to clarify. And then also um, I can talk to the people from Duke and others about how to make sure you're focused on your capstone. And then also if you you want some ideas on how to study. So I have two to refer to you, Rita. Um, several people have asked, um, well, I can answer this one. Are the scenario sets included in the 180? Yes. And I've, re I've said this a couple times, so in case you missed it, there are no specified number of scenario sets. It's not designated. Rita was hypothesizing what it might be, just looking at the numbers and all of that. Um, but it is going to be, it's going to vary from one exam. So right. one person to another, it's, it's, it's random. They're going to, we, all we know is they're going to be interspersed throughout the exam. Right. Um, we have a question about accommodations. If you, if you request accommodations, look at the testing accommodations handbook from MBCOT and you have to apply for testing accommodations when you apply for the exam. Right. So honestly, MBCOT's webpage, very thorough. It is. Lots of and questions, Rita, about, um, when the 10th edition will be available. Right. So I did put that in. And then the last question was how much time should we put into studying hours, weeks, et yeah. cetera. I, yeah, and I just want to um, emphasize the 10th edition is ready to go. The cover is just being finalized. Um, those of you who have the 9th edition and are taking the exam in 2024, Therapy Ed will give you, say you've done all your studying, but you just want to you know, take the new type of exam. Therapy Ed will give you an access code to access those exams when they're ready, okay? And so you will be able to do that with no charge. And they will also, for those of you maybe who bought the ninth edition but haven't completed your studying and you want the extra information that is in the 10th edition, they will give you a link to a complimentary ebook, which will also include access to the exams. So the ebook should be ready, I was told gonna to be ready very soon. Um, if not before Christmas, right after Christmas, um, the ebook, the printing, because, you know, paper takes time and that um, the hard copy will be a little bit, you know, longer. I do request, though, that if you have the ninth edition, if you could wait till after the holidays and depending upon when you take the exam, you know, if you're not taking the exam, you know, January 15th, wait even until like after the new year to request the ebook because you have to contact the office and basically the person who handles all these requests is a person named Michelle Emery. And December is a very, very busy month in early January for courses. So she has a lot to handle. And I, if she gets bombarded, the reality is your, your requests may fall by the wayside to be honest, just be lost in the deluge. So if you don't need the book right away, the 10th edition, study from the ninth edition because wheelchairs, the wheelchair measurements are the wheelchair measurements. Reflexes are we reflexes. Ear hearts, you know, development of grasp is, has been the same since I was in school. So, you know, you know, study those foundational things that you need to know. And then after the holiday, say, okay, I'm ready for more stuff. And then contact her. Um, so that will be ready. And the exams, I anticipate that, you know, there will be an exam that will be formatted very, very, very soon. I don't want to say because I'm not in, in charge of those processes, but it will be very soon. And then they'll they'll roll out one right away so people have it. And then as the next one is done, they'll roll it out. And the next one, they'll roll out the next one. So there will be three complete ones that you will have access to, okay? They just will not be available at the exact same time because to be honest, the peer review process is rigorous and we're 
we're all educators who have other, you know, um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot that goes into this and we, we want to make sure we're doing it thorough. Okay. Um, and oh, how much, how much you should study. That is a very individualized question. And in our manual, we have the forms that we, you know, present and we always say in the course, you know, here's the guidelines, but for the individual circumstances, you need to adjust. But basically MBCOT in there, when they report every year to program directors, and I attend these meetings, they say that the the average person who takes the exam, the typical range is between four to eight weeks, you know, four, and two, you know, some people two to eight, but most people take within four to six weeks. So we give an example of five weeks in the um in our manual. They also say that the average person, now every year varies a little bit, but the average person typically does somewhere in the low twenties of studying. Sometimes one year it's 23 year hours, one year it's 26, but it's around there. And but then you have to think about if you work full time, is that possible? So instead of studying 25 hours a week for four weeks, we talk in the manual, the example is someone does 20 hours a week because they work full time for five, five weeks. And they basically, you know, study, you know, a couple days, a couple hours every night, except for Friday, study Saturday in the morning, Saturday afternoon, but no studying Saturday night, study Saturday, Sunday, one to three. And they were, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday morning, and they're still getting in 20 hours of working full time. So it's doable. And we talk about making it doable for yourself. Okay. The thing you want to do, and this is for those of you from Duke who are doing your OTD, a good thing to do if you are going on your field work and, and do or doing your capstone is always make that your priority. But if you know there's something that you that has been hard for you or you studied it a long time ago, like I know my students at University of Scranton were five, we were a five-year program. So when they had their PEDS course, that was like in their junior year. So by the time they did all their senior year, grad year and field work, that was three years ago and they hadn't studied PEDS. So if you know there's something that has a lot of detail and it's going to be a lot to master and it's been a long time since you look at do some studying, you know, do, do the review in chapter five this way and master it in between doing all you want to do for your field work and capstone. And then in between, you know, then when you go back and you're ready to study full time, you're done. Transcripts ready to go. You take the therapy, of course, you're ready to go. Then you just have to review it. You don't have to study it. You know, it's not going starting from ground zero. The other thing is if you are someone who's a keen aesthetic learner, you know, make your study cards. Now, you, you, the book is the highlights of everything. The authors have con have condensed everything and synthesized everything in purposely into a bullet format. Because when the um, two professors at Boston University who did the PT book, which was the predecessor to the OT book, they studied basically what makes effective exam preparation. And one of the biggest advices was basically hardwiring your brain not to think in a narrative like in a treatment plan or reading case studies. It's the bump, bump, bump objective. That's why the book is purposely done in an outline format. It's a bump, 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 because that gets you into the, your brain gets wired into thinking just by the book, not adding in all the details and complexities of field work. So if you are a person who, who likes to make your own study cards, Review the stuff that's a review. You don't have to do that. But the stuff that's hard, make your own card. We talk about in the course and in the book and in the manual about making cards like for each age. A neonate, three months old, six months old, nine months old, 12 months, 18 months, two years, and then like three years, and then preschool, elementary school. And when you make a card that has all the milestones, you're studying. And then when they say an 18-month-old, you remember, you know, um, Eddie, the 18 month old or Tommy, the two year old, you know, so that's a good thing to do while you're doing your capstone or field work, you know, organizing yourself and prioritizing what needs, what you know will be hard for you. So you're going to take it down a notch instead of having to study hard and review. The other thing is if you, you are doing, for those of you doing field work, if you're doing a, a field work in a, a musculoskeletal rehab place, you know, that does upper extremity injuries and hand injuries, Chapter six and 11, you study that because that's relating to your field work. You know, if you're doing a capstone, you know, with domestic violence shelter, you know, review that information, but then review all of the things about trauma and all the different, you know, 
psychosocial in, in you know psychosocial disorders the psychosocial interventions that you would use so that would be reviewing chapter 10 and 14 and then for everyone you know reviewing chapter four is kind of very holistic and covers so that's the other thing is you know use the review and study guide to in preparation for your field work or your capstone and throughout um i don't know if there's any other questions about yeah i've got a couple thing. questions rita okay great um one person said Will we be notified by email when the 10th edition ebook and exams have been updated or do we have to reach out first in order to get the updates? Um, but I think the easy way to do it, they don't have everyone's email. So, and and again, that would um, be very cost prohibitive to do that given the thousands of students that take our courses. And you don't know, like if someone took the course in November, they may, they may be taking the exam tomorrow. You know, we don't know who is. So it would be, it would be also giving, right. sending people emails so that they don't I, want. I suggested, Rita, that we could request that that information be put out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yes. So and obviously me, on the webpage. Yes, on the webpage. Yes, and that would be the thing I would check. And I'll also send a, a blast to program directors and ask them to share okay. that with you. Now, I can't put it on community because I could do this because this is, you know, I gave information about our products, but I'm not like selling a product. You know, you could take or leave what I say right. tonight, you know. And I'm also giving you objective information about the exam. So that is within community's ethical guidelines. And, you know, and I'm not saying, I just say, consider these questions when you when you buy a product. I'm not telling you to buy any product. But if I say, like, here's the book for sale, I can't do that on community. That would be crossing a boundary, and I would not do that. But I can tell program directors. So, and so those of you who heard things from program director, you will hear it from program director. But yeah, definitely, definitely um, check on the website because they will announce it. And then even if you see it on the website and you know you're not taking the exam for another like six weeks, seven weeks, just hold off a week. <laughs> I'm and trying to I also said we could, announce, we could announce it on the online office hours. Oh yes, we can announce it online office hours and go to, and those of you who are doing capstone and field work, Tuesday nights, make a date with the online office hours, seven to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Our instructors put together really good, solid reviews and you can ask questions. Um, again, 2024 with some of the multiple choice questions will change the format. No, the, the multiple choice, the traditional multiple choice are the same. What is new is the six option multi-select multiple choice. So you will have multiple choice items that select one out of three or four. You'll have other multiple choices that'll say select three out of six, but still a multiple choice form, but that's the change. But there's no CST items anymore. So that's, and that's where it becomes more user-friendly. There's also a question, Rita, about what are the main differences between the ninth and the 10th editions? Well, the, the main, the main changes are that I've, I, I retired from full-time teaching in 2019. So I finally had to be honest time to put a lot of the content that's very dense in the outlines, like in chapter four, into those boxes that I showed you. All that information about Medicare A, B, durable medical equipment, homebound, that was always in the text, but now, but it was in that one form. Now it's very easy to see. So it's more user-friendly. The other thing is all the content hints, the outline content outline hints are now for the 2022 content outline, not 2018. So we updated all the hints. We also updated the, um, the information that is new. So we have a section about burnout. Um, we also added more visuals as far as like splints, um, mirror therapy, um, as far as like contemporary motor learning theory. We have splints also related to neurophysiological. And the other main difference is, you know, the tables have been expanded. We also, I also added information about the ABC approach and positive behavioral supports in school systems. So basically all the chapter contributors, including myself, because I contributed chapters, we all went to the literature and said, what are the things that are now common um, practice? Like in schools, positive behavioral supports. And we, you know, responsive, responsive intervention we had before, but positive behavioral supports and the ABC approach to behaviors in school, that's very dominant now in the literature. So we have information about that. Now, that said, if you don't study those few things, you're probably not, you won't fail the exam if you have mastery of all the other content that's in chapter nine, because that's a lot of foundational content. Um, 
So, but there are there are significant, um, I guess, visual improvements and formatting improvements, and then the content's been been updated. Um, like Mark, you know, Colleen expanded information about the the MEM, you know, for for edema reduction. Um, we've added, you know, some new evaluations that are more commonly used now, you know, um, and updated those. I'm trying to think of some other key things. We've added more review questions. You know, we've added more review questions at the end of each chapter to reflect that new content. And so I have to, at the end of the year, I, I need to put together like a list of that. But I think the biggest changes are that it's it's more accessible to visual learners and it has anything that was new content on the MBCAT exam, like burnout prevention is now in the book, okay? But for the most part, to be honest, the new information that was included in the new content outline, we had it already. You know, we really did. Like, you know, we, we, we had that information. We always had about medication side effects and precautions because we all know that that's critical to safe and competent practice. It's our responsibility to know those. So we've always had that. And now it's just clearly stated that you need to know it on, on you know, in the outline. So now we have like a table. You know, some of the meds now were more in table format, like all the um, all the cardiac meds now are in a table format rather than being with each thing. So we've just tried to make it more user friendly. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, if you go to basically the the therapy ed website, if you just go to OTR, you'll have the bar come up, and it has all the products. You know, review and study guide, course, app, tutoring and the free online office hours. You click on it, you scroll down, it just and it gives the list and just says join now and you just join now. You don't have to register. You don't have to give personal information. You just click and you're in, you know. Any other questions that people have? Now, those of, those of you who are still from Duke, did that, um, I hope that answered your, your question. That's why I, you know, um, Bob had asked me if I, if I, because I sometimes have done like half hour sessions for schools, but then when I realized that, and that was before we knew we were going to have an encore presentation, I'd said I would do a half hour. And then she said, well, the encore, I'm going to have them go. I said, well, you know, there's no need then to do another half hour if they're coming to this anyway, because um, I can just address it because it's not, it's pretty basic. You know, you use your time well and study things that are relevant and, and just enjoy your field work and capstone because there'll be time to study afterwards. You know, Julia, I, I, you would have to do contact therapy and I don't know because if they're doing the, you know, a physical exchange with, with um, hard copies, I'm, I'm not aware of that policy and I'm not the one who does that. Yeah. I, yeah, again, yeah. Paula just wrote like we, I don't know because, um, yeah, Stephanie, the, the recording will be posted on Therapy Edge YouTube page. And I will post the link, the direct link on the student community page. And I will also send the direct link to program directors to share with students. Okay. And the current, the one I did on November 15th, which covered the fundamentally the same material, but then different questions from people is already posted. Okay, that one did get posted. All right, any other questions? All right, Paul, I'd like to thank you very much again for your very competent help. Oh, my pleasure. I was typing as fast as I could. Any study <laughs> I, I, tip for any study tip for someone who missed one point from the 2023 exam and taking in 2024? You know what my biggest tip is? Start with self-assessment. This is a new plan. This isn't, I just need to earn one point. This is, you need 450 points. So do self-assessment and then have a plan. Review what you feel like you know at least adequately, but really study what are gaps in your content and you don't feel comfortable with at all and do a lot of practice exams. Work on really figuring out how to answer them using your critical reasoning. So in the therapy ed review and study guide, I love that the rationales are as thorough as they are because then you can think about how you thought for the question and compare it to that rationale. 
that's those are my biggest tips and, and I, take it I, seriously and really study yeah i i agree and a I, I i think also maybe thinking about the process because one point off you know you do have to earn the 450 but you know it's not as intimidating as as you know having 30 points off so do though think about what were the things that maybe you struggle with but also think about the process did you spend too much time on something that you know you were struggling with so was your timing off and then did you rush at the end you know think about the process of how you approached it sometimes people see something they don't know and they kind of spiral the nice part and, and get you know lose their self-confidence the nice part now is because with cst i was that happened in cst i mean you didn't have any choice you had to complete it now if that happens with a scenario set item you could just mark it and go back to it later later so i would think about oh you were rushing at the end yeah yeah see that makes a difference gonna, too it makes a difference it really does make a difference so if you find yourself spending too much time in iowa or getting spiraling guess because you may guess right mark it and keep going at a nice steady pace so that at the end you're not rushing because it's it's the knowledge part like paul has said taking it serious and studying but it's also being aware of your process and if you haven't taken the therapy ed course i i would suggest it may be worth the investment if you have the book you don't have to pay for the book so it'll be about two hundred dollars a hundred a day but it's it is very well worth it as far as teaching those strategies particularly your time management skills and how not to rush. If you already took the course, you can retake it for free. And sometimes taking it after you had the experience of not passing the exam, a lot of stuff rings more true. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh yeah, I did that. I need to not do that again. So just that insight that you you said you were rushing at the end, that's a very important insight. So I would work with that and consider maybe, you know, taking the course to practice it. Like Paul said, practicing. So the good part about the course is you'll practice all those strategies and getting to a routine of how to approach it so that you do earn that 450. I'd also like to add one other tip and that's, please consider this, you now have an advantage. You don't have to wonder what it's like to sit there for that four hour exam and you have the energy to do it and how are you gonna manage it? What are the questions really like? You know what it's like, you've been there, you've done that. You can prepare differently just with that insight and that advantage. Yeah. And that's why sometimes the course rings true for people. And after the second time, when they take the course, they do so much better because it, it rang true because they had that lived experience. You're exactly right. That was kind of, thank you, Paul, because that's what I was kind of getting to. I think we read the same book, Rita. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think we, we, we share, we share common lived experiences. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank everyone, and I hope to see you at an online office hour session and possibly at an AOTA conference. Come stop by the therapy booth and say hello, and I wish you much success, and good night. AOTA conference in Orlando in March, everybody. Yes, and we will be there. All right. I'm already, I'm already registered. <laughs> good night, Paula. Thank you so much. Good night. Good seeing you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.